For the first time in history, people and machinery are working together, realizing a dream. A uniting force that knows no geographical boundaries without regard to race, creed, or color. A new era where communication truly brings people together. This is the dawn of the net. Want to know how it works? Click here to begin your journey into the net. Now exactly what happened when you clicked on that link? You started a flow of information. This information travels down into your own personal mailroom where Mr. IP packages it, labels it, and sends it on its way. Each packet is limited in its size. The mailroom must decide how to divide the information and how to package it. Now the package needs a label containing important information such as sender's address, receiver's address, and the type of packet it is. Because this particular packet is going out onto the internet, it also gets an address for the proxy server, which has a special function, as we'll see later. The packet is now launched onto your local area network, or LAN. This network is used to connect all the local computers, routers, printers, etc., for information exchange within the physical walls of the building. The LAN is a pretty uncontrolled place, and unfortunately, accidents can happen. The highway of the land is packed with all types of information. These are IP packets, Novell packets, Apple Talk packets. They're going against traffic, as usual. The local router reads the address and, if necessary, lifts the packet onto another network. Ah, the router. A symbol of control in a seemingly disorganized world. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, this one here, this one here. Oh, this one here, this one goes here. I, I don't like this one. Let's go this one. Let's go here. I have a little bit of that one. Let's go this one here. We'll go to Jan here. Let's put that one here. Let's put that one here. Let's put that one here. There he is. Systematic, uncaring, methodical, conservative, and sometimes not quite up to speed. Sorry. But at least he is exact. For the most part. As the packets leave the router, they make their way into the corporate internet and head for the router switch. A bit more efficient than the router, the router switch plays fast and loose with IP packets, deftly routing them along their way. A digital pinball wizard, if you will. As packets arrive at their destination, they're picked up by the network interface, ready to be sent to the next level. In this case, the proxy. The proxy is used by many companies as sort of a middleman in order to lessen the load on their internet connection and for security reasons as well. As you can see, the packets are all of various sizes depending upon their content. The proxy opens the packet and looks for the web address, or URL. Depending upon whether the address is acceptable, the packet is sent onto the internet. There are, however, some addresses which do not meet with the approval of the proxy, that is to say corporate or management guidelines. 
these are summarily dealt with. We'll have none of that. For those who make it, it's on the road again. Next up, the firewall. The corporate firewall serves two purposes. It prevents some rather nasty things from the internet from coming into the intranet. And it can also prevent sensitive corporate information from being sent out onto the internet. Once through the firewall, a router picks up the packet and places it onto a much narrower road, or bandwidth, as we say. Obviously, the road is not broad enough to take them all. Now, you might wonder what happens to all those packets which don't make it along the way. Well, when Mr. IP doesn't receive an acknowledgement that a packet has been received in due time, he simply sends a replacement packet. We are now ready to enter the world of the internet. A spider web of interconnected networks which span our entire globe. Here, routers and switches establish links between networks. Now, the net is an entirely different environment than you'll find within the protected walls of your land. Out here, it's the Wild West. Plenty of space, plenty of opportunities, plenty of things to explore and places to go. Thanks to very little control and regulation, new ideas find fertile soil to push the envelope of their possibilities. But because of this freedom, certain dangers also lurk. You'll never know when you'll meet the dreaded ping of death. A special version of a normal request ping, which some idiot thought up to mess up unsuspecting hosts. The path our packets take may be via satellite, telephone lines, wireless, or even transoceanic cable. They don't always take the fastest or shortest routes possible, but they will get there, eventually. Maybe that's why it's sometimes called the worldwide wait. But when everything is working smoothly, you can circumvent the globe five times over at the drop of a hat, literally, and all for the cost of a local call or less. Near the end of our destination, we'll find another firewall. Depending upon your perspective as a data packet, the firewall could be a bastion of security or a dreaded adversary. It all depends on which side you're on and what your intentions are. The firewall is designed to let in only those packets that meet its criteria. This firewall is operating on ports 80 and 25. All attempts to enter through other ports are closed for business. Port 25 is used for mail packets. While port 80 is the entrance for packets from the internet to the web server. Inside the firewall, packets are screened more thoroughly. Some packets make it easily through customs, while others look just a bit dubious. Now, the firewall officer is not easily fooled, such as when this ping of death packet tries to disguise itself as a normal ping packet. It's okay, go on. It's okay. No problem. Have a nice day. Be out of here. Bye. For those packets lucky enough to make it this far, the journey is almost over. It's just a line up on the interface to be taken up into the web server. Nowadays, a web server can run on many things, from a mainframe to a webcam to the computer on your desk. Why not your refrigerator? With a proper setup, you can find out if you have the makings for chicken cacciatore or if you have to go shopping. Remember, this is the dawn of the net. Almost anything's possible. One by one, the packets are received, opened, and unpacked. 
The information they contain, that is, your request for information, is sent on to the web server application. The packet itself is recycled, ready to be used again, and filled with your requested information. Addressed and sent out on its way back to you. Back past the firewall, routers, and on through to the internet. Back through your corporate firewall. And on to your interface. Ready to supply your web browser with the information you requested. That is, this film. Pleased with their efforts and trusting in a better world, our trusty data packets ride off blissfully into the sunset of another. Could someone say that? Yes. Okay, there's another video that I would like to show. There are the Baki Biju here. They are like the same way how the packets travel through the internet. Uh, okay, this is the data flow on the internet. It's also kind of the same. Now, uh, so this video, this uh, yeah, OSI model animation. Uh, this is more like a networking side video, but you will still understand a uh, little bit like how whenever the data is received in the computer or how is it sent from the computer. Okay. Uh, this one. One see the cake in it. So we have done the hub switch and router, right? Let me check this mistake. Does that show anything? Data transfer within and between networks. Wish to have Saudi. I have re had Arba. Between networks are assisted by various data transfer within and between networks are assisted by various devices, which we want to discuss now. In this video, you will get an idea how hubs, switches, gateways, and routers are working. A hub is a centralized half-duplex device to connect your network devices together to an internal network. At the center of a star network, it accepts with its multiple ports Ethernet connections from network devices. Hub means that only at a time uh, the data can transform from uh, one, uh, like it can transform one way. It cannot be two way. Full duplex means that the data can go and uh, like uh, go both sides at the same time. So basically hub is a, a hub is not considered to be intelligent because it rebroadcasts any signal receiving from one device to all other devices on the network. To tell it in another word, when data arrives to one of its ports, a copy of this is sent to all of the other ports. This is a big disadvantage, which not only causes security concerns, but also unnecessary traffic on the network. And think about all the devices connected to a hub are competing for immediate usage. Data collision can occur when two devices transmit simultaneously. Another reason to avoid a hub for messaging that require immediate response. You would characterize the hub as a level one device. If you want to send the data package straight to the destination without spamming the entire network, that is what switches do. Unlike a hub, a switch is intelligent. A switch can actually learn the physical addresses of the devices that are connected to it and it stores these physical addresses called MAC addresses in its table. But how do so? Let's start with an empty table. Computer A sends a data package to computer D, as the switch does not know where D is, so it just behaves like a hub and spams every computer. But it is learning. By checking the MAC address as a part of the data package, it learns that computer A can be found on port 1. If computer C sends now a data package to computer A, the switch can directly send the data to computer A without floating the entire network. 
Also, a new entry to the MAC table can be done. So when a data package is sent to a switch, it's only directed to the intended destination port. Switches are also full duplex devices that allow data signals to flow simultaneously in both directions. That means each port has its own collision domain. As a result, switches are far more preferred as hubs because they reduce any unnecessary traffic on the network. If you want to start a LAN party, you probably would need a switch. To characterize a switch within the OSI model, it is a level two device. Because the information sent also includes, for example, the MAC address, the information is also named as frame. A gateway is an active network node that can connect two networks that are physically incompatible with each other and or use a different addressing. Gateways couple the most different protocols and transmission methods. Here you see an example of the field of automation. Gateway can work on all layers of the OSI layer model. A router can be seen as a doorway out of your internal network into the outside world, what you call internet. A router can be seen as a network connecting device. Because a router not only uses the MAC address of the computer, but also the IP address, it can be classified as layer three device. The information sent is called data package. Watch also our next videos. So this is just an overview about the different devices. You can see all the differences. There are other, like many videos, but I try to find the ones that have less information uh, as uh, like just what we need for the book. Um, OK, so we have done the router, the hub, switch and the router. OK. The hub does not store any MAC or the IP addresses. It transmits every data packet to all the connected ports or the computers. Then the switch is a more intelligent than hub because it stores the uh, it stores the MAC addresses. Okay, so basically, switch can be used for uh, designing of the LANs within a building, uh, even if you don't need to connect to the internet, but you will, if you need to connect uh, to make a network inside a building, inside a room, you need a switch or a hub, but it is better to use the switch. Just, just wait a moment. Okay. And then comes the router when you need to connect to the internet or when you need to go outside of your network uh, or when you need to connect a LAN to a VAN. LAN is the local area network, the, like for example within your room, and the VAN is the wide area network that goes outside the boundary of the LANs. So when you need to connect to uh, different uh, 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 networks, you need a router. Technically, router is also a gateway it also acts as a gateway, but a gateway, as you saw in the video, it can be used to connect two different uh, networks that use a, that use uh, that are using different protocols. A gateway connect two networks of a different type. It is typically used as a router to connect a LAN to a VAN. When data leaves one network to move into another, it must pass through the gateway. Okay. A repeater is just as the name suggests, it just repeats the signals. Basically, it is used with the Wi-Fi signals, as you can see over here, to extend the radius of the, you know, the signal strength. It's an act, another name for an active hub. It boosts the signal along a network cable. A booster requires um, a power source and receives data packets from an incoming network cable. It will then retransmit those uh, data packets along its out outgoing network cable. This is necessary when the long cable lengths are required, typically over 100 meter, and the signal would not be strong enough to reach the destination on its own. They're like the signal boosters. So a similar degradation of signal happens with the wireless access points, and so wireless repeaters carry out the same function with the wireless signals. So a repeater can be used uh, with the wired network, uh, that has the internet cables 
how it can be used with the wireless uh, uh, signals as the uh, you know uh, as the wireless repeater. So a gateway, another, uh, an, uh, an, again, a gateway connects two diff, uh, networks of different type. Then a bridge. It connects two physically separate lands. Physically separate lands can be, for example, two rooms within the same building, just like our lab. We have lab one, we have lab two. They have their own network. But what if we need to connect to the other lab? So we need a bridge in between them. So a bridge basically connects two similar or the same type of networks. Okay. So a bridge connects two physically separate lands of the same type together so that the devices on one land can communicate with the devices on the other land. Then comes the firewall. You must have heard about it. The firewall is, uh, you can say, kind of a security guard on a on the gateway. The gateway can be the entrance or the exit of the of any network or any computer, for example. So a firewall is like a security check. It checks every data coming in or coming out. And uh, it prevents unauthorized access in this way. For example, even the firewall can be used to block some sites. It can be used uh, in the workplaces. It can be used uh, to, uh, you know, it checks the signals and it checks the data packets and checks that what they want, uh, are the ones uh, requested. If there is any, you know, uninvited data packet or uninvited uh, uh, information coming in, so it might be uh, you know, someone trying to get into the network. So it can block it or block the data packets. It prevents the external users gaining unauthorized access to a computer system. Now there are two types of firewall, either a software one or the hardware one. Uh, it can exist on your, it does exist on your computer systems. You can check in your settings even. When you go over here in your Wi-Fi se settings. Many uh, just search for the setting firewall and the network protection. So Windows basically has the built in firewall. Now this is the firewall is on domain network firewall is on. Okay. A firewall kya hai? Again, on my computer, whatever signals or whatever website, for example, I type in a, a web address, the uh, information or the web page needs to come into the computer. But if I haven't done anything or like it is inactive, the internet, I'm not using any kind of internet and the information is coming into the network, then why is it coming? So basically that is where the firewall checks. And it can be hardware, it can be placed within the uh, router or the switch. Okay, or it, it can be a separate uh, device also that can be attached to your network. It is usually positioned at the gateway to one network and will examine all incoming data to determine if it should be allowed. Data that is not allowed will be prevented from gaining access to the network. If I work on, can also prevent certain types of data from exiting a network as well as preventing unauthorized users from gaining access. A firewall can prevent malicious data packets from causing disruption to a computer system such as the DOS, denial of service attack. Um, I don't know. Uh, we did this in AS, right? Or in A2? We did this anyways, denial of service. Like basically like there's a lot of traffic on the internet. So what happens? The computers or the servers, they start denying the services because they cannot handle. It's just like a, you know, restaurant business. Too many customers come in, then they have to deny the customers that they cannot serve them. So same as with the servers, that if there is unnecessary traffic and, you know, uh, that is what, how that's, uh, you know, we say that like, the server down. Ho gaya. Server down is down. Like again, there are a lot of requests coming it uh, coming towards it and it cannot handle those requests. So the server like, you know, stops working in a way. This 
that is the denial of the basically most of the time it is because of a malware it is because of some uh, hackers doing it so that the server can go down and they can hack into the server so that is why it is called a denial of service attack so a firewall can prevent that if your computer or if the server has a firewall then it can see that there is some extra unnecessary traffic coming in uh, it can detect but it's not a hundred percent solution of course it is often configured as part of a router, but it can also be a software that is installed on a proxy server or individual computers. A proxy server would sit between the gateway and the LAN so that the data cannot pass through the network without being examined by its firewall software. So this is the thing that you saw in the video. The proxy server that detects each and everything and just uh, you know stops uh, the incoming traffic that is not allowed or that is not you know requested firewall software can also be installed on usual computers in order to prevent any unauthorized access or malicious attack from within a network from within a network for example uh we have 32 computers or you know 30 uh, i have like 25 computers on in the lab and you know it even it can happen uh that uh, that one computer is trying to access the other computer or that is kind of an unauthorized access as well So firewall will prevent also such kind of unauthorized access from within the network. Okay. Servers are basically the computers within the network that are providing some kind of the service. They are providing some kind of the resources. In the, in the network, uh, it comes in chapter six a peer to peer network or and the file server uh, network architecture if you remember that architecture is like how the network is designed how the ethernet cables are put in or how or what what are the actual physical lines architecture of the system of the network a peer to peer network is the one which has uh, like all the computers are at the same level there is no uh, like they are just connected to each other in the server client architecture is one computer or is will be a kind of a hi-fi computer with a, like large storage, large memory, large processing power so that it can give out the resources. The resources can be the files stored on its system. The resources can be the print printing services or the scanning services. You know, all of this can be done. So a server is a computer on a network which provides resources that can be used by the client devices. Individual servers or group of servers can perform a variety of functions depending on how they are configured. Again, these are just the computers. There is nothing different, but the configuration or the setting of the computer in it. And um, most of the time it is has to be do, do with the type of the operating system. There is one special operating system like a Windows server uh, operating system when you can install and uh, you know all the other computers will also have the same version uh, windows uh, server for example and all the other computers will need to log in for example into the uh, file server or the main server so that they can access the files or maybe they can uh, use the applications um, like uh, you know if you have used this uh, like the, the thing that we are using the teams and the one notebook and everything we have basically we are the client of the main server the main server is the microsoft over here we are the clients we have a login we have an email and the login or the id and the login uh, and the password so this is our specific login so what we are doing is we are connecting to uh, you know some place to uh, connecting to a computer or a huge computer or a mainframe you know computer uh, that is maybe some in some other country. And it is providing us our files, some services. We are using the application, so it is an application server as well. So a file server role is to make files available for users on the network. These files might be for individuals who have access to their own user area for file storage, or they may have files that are shared between groups of users. Same way, think of the cloud storage. We have Google Drive. You use OneDrive or iCloud for your file storage. 
um, Google Drive, all these, you know, cloud storage. What is happening? The files are saved on a computer that is not our computer. It is not on our computer, but it is somewhere on another computer. That is, uh, we have we are given a free storage of 15 GB area. Uh, like for example, in this, uh, uh, you know, for uh, our uh, school account, we are given I think one terabyte of uh, storage. So that one terabyte is specifically for uh, us. It is our user area. We can store any kind of file and we can also use a group that uh, will have the files that, uh, that can be shared between the group. For example, if I put any file in the teams, it is basically a SharePoint site. You would you could uh, see it over here. Um, yeah. Open in SharePoint, you can see this channel or even you can open your team in SharePoint. This is like again a cloud storage, but it's like a central hub. I think Betty ka hoga login is for just any other. Uh, anyways, this, this I can show you from here. This is the SharePoint. I think I'll have to open the team and then anyways, abhi, um, lamba kaam ho so uh, on your computers, you can check it on your own. So basically uh, like um, kar kya rahe the, what our purpose was. You know, it's confused. Teams with Microsoft Office are both confused. They're logs. Give me a minute. Okay. And depending on the permissions of each the of each user or the group of user files can be created, read, modified, and deleted. You can create your own file. Maybe you can read only the uh, some read only some of the files. Because you don't have access, you don't have the permission to edit on it. So this is true for some of the files that the teachers share. They have the, uh, you know, the authors, they have the permission to edit, but uh, others only have the permission to read. So this is a file server. Then a print server, it deals with all the print jobs on a network. We can make one computer as a print server. The printer will be connected to that computer and it will handle all the print jobs or the print queues or any kind of, you know, uh, things coming to it. Its job will be to queue, make a queue and, you know, manage uh, or give equal time to every computer. And it can also be used to limit the number of pages for each user. For example, if you're using we are using uh, and client server architecture, the clients are logged in and user number one, user number two, every every user have like maybe, you know, uh, 100 pages print per week or per month. Uh, you know, that is a quota it is called. So that quota can be managed. So all of this can be managed by the print server. Each time a client computer sends a request for printing, it will be added to the queue on the print server. The print server will then deliver each print job in turn to the printer. There may be several printers that are managed by the server. Each client computer or users may be given priority and so may be able to jump the queue. It is also possible to print 
So I were to charge users for each print job, which is usually done by reducing the number of print credits available to the user. Even the charge, extra charge can be done for each user. All of this can, uh, you know, software is are available that can be used with a print server uh, to do all of that stuff. Then comes the mail server. Again, you when you open Outlook, when we are opening our own organization email, we are using the email server. Uh, receives and sends all emails for an organization. The mail server can be part of the LAN or the WAN. Incoming emails are checked for the viruses, phishing or spam. And then send to the user's mailbox. When a user sends an email, the mail server will either direct it to the another user within the organization or send it on to the internet for delivery to another mail server. For example, we use our official email to send an email to Gmail. Then these are the two email servers. Gmail is another server. Pisces.edu.sa is another server. So again, everything is managed by the email server. Application server delivers software to the client computers. How there may be like, you know, a centralized uh, installation of the application and then you can log in using the same uh, credentials and you can use the same application. The best example is again, uh, you know, this all of this that we use over here. You know, when we open office.com, all of these are the different applications, but these are not installed. You don't even need to install them on your own computer. You need to just access them. When it open in the web browser, there's nothing it's being installed on the computer. Um, same way like Google Docs, Google Slides, you know, any kind of you know application that you uh, are doing uh, in, uh, cloud computing. This is the cloud computing. We are basically not installing uh, the sys applications on our computer. We can use them anywhere. We can use the same thing Baba. on our mobile. Baba. Baba. So application is. Uh, this can be done by the clients accessing the software directly from the server or by the server managing the installation of the software onto each client computer. This can also be done a smaller version or you know a uh, kind of the client version of the application can be installed directly from the server you don't have to go to each computer and install the application then comes the proxy server the proxy server deals with all the requests to the internet you have seen the proxy server in actual working in the animation in the movie so again, it uh, sits between the LAN and the gateway. It will check each request is allowed and filter out any undesirable request, such as you know in, in inappropriate websites. It will also store web pages in a cache. Cache is something. Um, you know, whenever you open a website, a copy of it is saved in a cache. And sometimes when you are online, you can view that copy in the offline. And even when you, you know, uh, visit the page next time, it will check that whatever is in the cache and it will see the difference. And then if it is the same, it will just, you know, reload the page from the cache. So what will happen that it doesn't need to again go to the proxy server or outside the Internet to request the same page again and again. So it will store the web pages in cache will speed up the time it takes for the user to receive a web page. A proxy server often also includes the firewall software. So again, uh, when we're doing the firewall, this was what we said that it works with the proxy server and basically uh, proxy server will again will be a computer. It will not be a you know something like uh, it can be hardware or it can be a just a proper computer which will have the actual firewall. Mm. How much time do we have? I don't want to uh, do too much of the tasks. Um, Let's just finish it till 
uh, this page band bandwidth and the bit rate. We have discussed the bandwidth many times. I have told you in short term that a bandwidth is the uh, like the capacity of the internet of your uh, data package, for example. It may is the or the more technical definition is the range of frequencies available on a communication channel defines the its capacity bandwidth is measured in frequency in kilohertz or as a transmission rate in bits per second like in one second how many bits are there of course higher the bits uh, higher the number then that means that it is a good bandwidth although the bandwidth is often thought of as a speed it is actually the number of bits per second that the line is capable of transmitting rather than the actual speed of transmission. It is therefore the maximum possible speed of the data transfer. Okay, but the transmission speed is often referred to as the bit rate. Okay, so this is the difference between bandwidth and the bit rate. The bandwidth is basically the maximum possible speed, but the actual transmission speed is the bit rate. A one gigabits per second line in a network is capable of transmitting a maximum of 1 billion um, bits per second. A 38 Mbps fiber optic internet connection from an ISP is capable of transmitting a maximum of 38 million bits per second. If a computer within the network is downloading data from the internet, then the maximum speed is uh, 38 Mbps and not 1 uh, Gbps as the connection to the ISP is a bottleneck. Do you understand the bottleneck? Anyone? Bottleneck is, uh, how do I explain it? It is something like this. Now my drawing with the mouse is actually very bad. That is why I don't use the whiteboard. Now, for example, if we have these number of traffic, you can say we have seven lanes or eight lanes, eight lanes of traffic or in this case, eight lanes of data. But if we go forward, then what will happen? The actual, uh, for example, this is the width of the road over here or the width of the wire itself and then it decreases. So this is a bottleneck. So what is happening? This is the ISP. The ISP is, you know, uh, okay, so this is your um, uh, your computer on this side. It is your computer. And on this side is the ISP. Now ISP is basically uh, again. It's a computer. It's a mainframe computer that is servicing many other computers and there is a lot of traffic coming from all the sites. They will be coming from here, from here, from here and from here as well. So what is happening that even if the speed of the ISP itself is one giga uh, bits per second. But over here it will be 38. The reason of this bottleneck. Because at the end the traffic has to reduce itself into, for example, from eight to three lanes. And that is why a bottleneck is created, which will reduce the traffic and even sometimes if uh, if you say ke mara, ke ISP ye jo hai, uh, it can go up to one giga but your connection will be maximum it is maximum possible capacity will be 38 uh, 38 kilobits per second I'm uh, sorry megabits per second so this is kind of a bottleneck OK, 
here. So this is the bits, uh, sorry, bandwidth and the bit rate. Bandwidth is the maximum capacity, maximum speed of the data transfer and the bit rate is the actual transmission speed and a rate, you know, it's like one second in, in one second, how many bits are uh, passing at one point. Then we have bit streaming. You have uh, uh, when whenever you see YouTube, you are streaming a video. That is what we call video streaming like Netflix or you know stars like the, these uh, you know TV channels, t TV services, websites. They use. Video streaming now the streaming is what like it will uh, again if it is a one hour video, it will divide it into five, five minutes or even one minute and one minute will be downloaded and then you can see it. The next minute will download, then you can see it. It's not like the whole uh, video file will be downloaded and you can see it like anytime. Although you can, you know, move the cursor uh, forward and backward, but whenever you request it, then the uh, data will come. It's not like it will come as a whole. A bit stream is a series of bits which represent stream of data transmitted at one time. Although usually refers to communication, it can also be applied to data in memory or the storage. In networking, streaming takes place when video or audio files um, are sent to receiving device for viewing or listening to without downloading the file to save in the storage. With the video, the first few seconds consisting of several frames will be sent to fill a buffer. Buffer is kind of a temporary area for storage, which can then be watched at the receiving device. As the frames within the buffer are viewed, they are removed so that more frames can be added to the buffer to keep it full. A buffer is used to keep the video running smoothly. Without a buffer, any data congestion would be noticed by the video pausing, missing out frames or pixelating until the full transmission rate was available again, even if it was only for a split second. It is still possible that a buffer could be fully used during data congestion, but it is much less likely that if a buffer was not present. Data congestion can be caused by devices on the same network using up so much bandwidth that there isn't enough left for full video transmission or a similar situation at the sending end of the transmission. So, you know, uh, many times, you know, even for me, it is happening that now there is another uh, family in our neighbor who are using our same network and many times it happens that you know we say okay, website is not opening it's the internet is so slow it is lagging and you can't open a website you can't even watch a, a video for example it takes too much time the reason again there are dead, dead, there is a lot of data congestion there are the many devices connected on the same network so they they have they're using the bandwidth. So but as YouTube, for example, it uses the streaming, it needs the bandwidth or it needs to put some of the data into the buffer or uh, buffer is kind of, you know, just like a Koga. It will be kind of a, you know, a, st a small storage space on your own computer. But of course, the data needs to be transferred continuously so that the video can run smoothly. If the data is not transferred continuously, then of course that is why the uh, uh, video uh, pauses a lot. Or even it can happen to the server side, server side like maybe too many users connecting to the uh, to YouTube at the same time. Uh, again, that is like uh, uh, clogging of the denial of the service attack, something like this. Let's just give me a moment. Okay. 
the same situation regarding to buffering applies to audio streaming at as it does to the video streaming this is not just used for video and audio streaming on demand but also when streamed live for example when watching a sporting event or the live news and now you know every social uh, uh, um, facebook has we have facebook live we have youtube live uh, most commonly used is the facebook live by any kind of marketers sellers also you know they just start a video so again that is kind of a real time but uh, uh, now just think of the data travel in this case the first the data is being traveled to the server itself and then it is uh, going to many receivers at the same time so unless and until it has a very good bandwidth the live video uh, you know the uh, the person who is starting the live video he or she has very good bandwidth then this would just be a very poor quality video this means the live events that are streamed are actually delayed by the size of the buffer you increase the size of the buffer then you have more storage space to store the receiving uh, you know um data uh, receiving um, frames and um, even if you don't view them at the at that time that is why you could be watching a rugby match on television and see a try being scored before you see it on the live stream because so video stream goes to the buffer and then goes to the receiving device so when you increase the size of this buffer then the quality of the streaming will also improve a byte stream is a bit stream that consists of bytes it is also known as an octet otherwise bit streaming means that bits like or the zeros are ones are being sent at a time a byte would be like one whole byte is being sent at a time so that is an octet uh tomorrow inshallah we will do the circuit switching packet switching and the message switching and if we i think we have two lessons or i don't know one lesson and we can go forward to the media or the methods of the uh, optical storage optical communication okay guys do watch all the videos they explain very well i will also share something about uh, the bits uh, the streaming and about the switching techniques as well uh, it will give you an uh, you know just a preview of the topic um also one more thing guys you are not attending quran or arabic lessons i am receiving daily messages from those teachers i'm i'm sure ki like not all of you but some of you are not attending and your name is the one that i am receiving from those teachers like uh, dua is not here but dua is giving the exam so of course she does have a valid reason to be uh, you know not taking the extra subjects lessons but the others you guys you are like you're not doing anything even if you are in the school you cannot skip the classes um okay let's call um let them the classes you know miss rehana right <laughs> she just knows every student that who is not attending the arabic lesson so just uh, and she will keep me updated as well okay this goes for everyone 